It's really hard to follow that. <laughs> but I'm energized, and I hope you're energized too, because I'm going to talk about energy. So where's the slides? There you go. The first question you should ask yourself is, why should we care about energy? So let me just explain a few things. Today, you may have gotten up in the morning and had a cup of hot coffee, and maybe you took the metro to come here, or uh, you drove your car. Unless you've taken a horse, which some in Washington seem to do, <laughs> you needed either oil or electricity. So when you go to a gas station and fill up your gas tank, you know, have you asked the question, where did that oil come from? Let me answer that. So the oil that we use, 50% or more than 50% of the oil that we use comes from other nations. And some of them don't quite share the values that we have. And we send our young men and women in uniform to protect that supply chain. It's a national security issue, let's face it. Secondly, you may be paying 3 and a half to $4 a gallon when you go to the gas station. Have you asked the question, how much do we pay as a nation? How much do we pay? Well, here are the, num here are the numbers. We pay about a billion dollars a day, almost $400 billion a year to buy that oil. Staggering number. And if we could spend that money here in the United States, imagine how much it would help our financial woes that we are facing today. So this is a national security issue and an economic issue. And we are not the only ones. Other nations, China, India, Japan, Germany, are all in the same boat. They're importing oil. And they're all looking for leadership, some way out of this. And the question is, can we provide the leadership? So since we're talking about the world, let's talk about the world. Let's see where the people are. People use energy. So this is the population density of the world. You can see where the people are in the United States. But the highest population densities are in Asia, in China, India, Malaysia, Indonesia, Japan. And not only do they have the highest population density, they also have the highest population growth, which is the future. That's what people are going to be. Now let's look at energy use. This is the satellite map stitched together off the Earth at night. And this is all the lights gives you a reflection of where the energy is being used. What is intriguing is if you overlay the two pictures and you get this. You find that the United States is bright, and we need to make it brighter in a sustainable way. But there are many people in the world who have not yet turned on the lights. And as their income levels grow up, they want to turn on the lights like anyone would. And to enable them to turn on the right kind of lights is perhaps the biggest economic opportunity of the 21st century. The question is, can we grab it? Because the technologies that are required to enable the rest of the world do not exist today. Many of them do not. So how do we win the future? Invent affordable, clean energy technologies affordable not just in the United States, but all across the world. Make them locally, sell them globally, which I believe is a route to a secure American future. So instead of the map of the world with things coming to the United States, how about turning that map around? How about starting at home first and enabling the rest of the world to use their own resources and live in a peaceful way? How about that? And those technologies do not exist. Because we did this, by the way, in information technology. We did this in biotechnology. We did this in automobiles. We enabled the world to wear jeans. <laughs> Hollywood, rock and roll music. We did all that. Can we do that in clean energy? But the innovation that is needed is required, and I'm going to show you a few of that, a few examples of that. 
But there's a global competition going on, and speed is of essence. So let me try to explain the pace and scale of innovation that is required. And the best way to do that, the only way I can think of, is to compare what happened in the last 100 years. So this is what happened in the last 100 years. Electrification, airplanes, nuclear energy, space technology, transits to integrated circuits, fiber optic wireless communication. We can't imagine our lives today without these technologies. And all of them were invented out here and we enabled the rest of the world. Imagine all of that happening for clean energy, clean and sustainable energy, in the next 10 to 20 years, because that's the window of opportunity we really have. If we can do that, I believe that is what we need to secure America's future. So allow me to show you a glimpse of that future. So let's talk about oil. The alternative to petroleum-based oil are what are called biofuels, or photosynthetic biofuels. We use plants, corn, ethanol, or sugarcane. We grab the energy from sunlight. We use plants to convert that into, take the carbon dioxide and fix the carbon dioxide somehow into carbohydrates. And somehow we can figure out, we have figured out how to make oil out of it. But what people often don't know is the efficiency of the process. You take sunlight to oil, and one would think it's about 10%, 20%, it's less than 1%. So if you are to make a lot of oil to feed our transportation, you will need a lot of land, a lot of water, and a lot of fertilizers. And because it is so dilute, it is expensive, because you've got to get all that together. So we in RPE said that, let's take a step back and see if we could think about this in a different way. If you are to design plants from scratch for energy, not corn or sugar cane, they were never designed for energy. If you are to design it for energy, what would it be like? And the answer came out from all our innovators out there in the United States that it would be quite different. Let me give you one example. There's a group in California that is taking algae or the metabolic pathway of algae. Algae can make oil, but it doesn't grow very well. So they said, why don't we take the useful part of algae, use synthetic biology, and put it into a plant like tobacco, which grows in bad soil, so that tobacco can produce gasoline directly. If that works, imagine this. This is taking big oil and big tobacco and putting it together <laughs> and saving the world. You can't get better than this. But that's going on. I hope this works. But we at RPE said that maybe we could do even better. Why use plants? Because there's a lot of plants, out, a lot of biology out there that is not photosynthetic. You and I are not plants. We don't use photosynthesis. So we created a program called electrofuels. This word does not exist in the dictionary yet. <laughs> Let me explain how it works. You take electricity, which we have produced domestically from things like nuclear, from sunlight, from wind, renewable sources, and we use non-photosynthetic microbes. These are microbes deep down in the ocean where there's no sunlight, but they have very efficient biology. And we, they live on electrons. And these bugs have been programmed to survive and eat electrons and produce oil. And people thought this is impossible. This is science fiction, never going to work. A lot of naysayers, by the way. And we said, let's give it a shot, because I believe in the innovation in the United States. So we gave them a target and said, let's go for it. And so they have produced oil. This is the first bottle of electrofuel, a biofuel that has been produced without the use of sunlight, purely on electricity. And this is from a company called OPX Biotechnology, which is in Colorado, working with North Carolina State University. And not only them, there's a group at MIT that is producing oil from electricity, and there are 13 other groups try to outdo them and produce electricity, produce oil from electricity. If this works out, we don't know whether it will, 
this will be, this will create the foundation for an entirely new industry. But we are making, we are taking electricity to oil for transportation. We said, maybe there's a better way. Why not electricity to transportation, which are called electric vehicles, electric cars. The problem with today's electric cars is that it's too expensive and the range is not too long, not too big, because the problem is in the battery. So we at RPE created a program called Batteries for Electrical Energy Storage for Transportation, or BEAST. And the way we thought about it is that instead of making incremental improvements in your lithium-ion battery, why not we go for that quantum leap of battery, which will, have, which will enable the electric car to have a longer range, going from Chicago to St. Louis, 300 miles, on a single charge, and be actually cheaper than gasoline-based cars. Because that's the way to create a sustainable business. You don't rely on subsidies then. That battery does not exist anywhere in the world. We said that's what, where we want to go. And so there's a whole competition going on in the United States, creating a whole class of metal air batteries, lithium air, zinc air, aluminum air, magnesium air batteries. The fuel out there is air. It's cheap. And that is going on. So this is, and there's some really early successes and but that you will see soon. And I hope in future, just like you have Intel inside your computers today, we hope you have a beast inside your electric cars in the future. <laughs> so if you are to electrify a transportation, the electricity has to come from somewhere. It flows through the grid. And if you drive down I-95, for example, you will see all these cables going out there. Those are the transmission lines. And the electricity that goes in those transmission lines are typically around a few hundred thousand volts, almost a million volts. And the electricity that comes out of your power outlet is about 120 volts. You don't want a million volts coming out of your homes. So how do you do that? So there are devices called transformers. This is not the movie. This is real transformers. <laughs> this is what they look like. So if you go down the highway again, you'll see the substations. This is really important. This is our infrastructure. Substation where you have these transformers. Today, they're about 10,000 pounds. We buy almost all of them from overseas. There's a backlog of about six to nine months. And this is not that different from what Nikola Tesla did in 1890s. We haven't changed much. And the average age of the transformers on our grid is 42 years, two years beyond the lifetime. Think about it. If something goes wrong, we have a problem. So we at RPE created a program on power conversion technology to take the quantum leap. It said we cannot do this over and over again, just buy from overseas and install it. So these new transformers are being built with semiconductors, silicon carbide, gallium nitride, semiconductors. And instead of running at 60 hertz, 60 kilohertz. And if you do that, that 10,000 pounds shrinks to 100 pounds. You don't need a crane. You can put it in a suitcase and take it with you. So, and this is not only lighter, this is cheaper, this is smarter, because you can feed signals into it and manipulate the transistor. That's what is going on. And we sort of said that, okay, if this we could do, and if you put it in the grid, these are single devices, what would it be like as a system? Because today, if you turn on the light in your home, somewhere, somewhere, there's a generator which turns on or ramps up, and the electricity flows like water down a slope. There is no control over it. It just flows. We cannot route electricity like we route information in the internet. So we said maybe with these devices, we think of it as a system we could do better. And we created a program called Genie, Green Electricity Network Integration. So the future of the grid is going to be, you're going to have power generation from wind and solar, from coal or nuclear, we're going to have store some of the electricity, packetize it, send it, route it the way you want to your homes. We have a backbone of information and communication and control so that we can manage it. So eventually, you have a secure grid, you have a reliable grid, and it won't go, won't go down. That is what is going on right now. So let me end by saying, folks, this is real. This is not science fiction. This is happening today in the United States. We can win the future. And what you just saw 
is a glimpse of that future. Thank you very much indeed.